sort of straddled the line. I was in a community called the Diggers, and the Diggers were kind of, well, we were not hippies. We were not flower children. Most of us were armed, and we weren't kidding around. And we wanted to imagine a world that we wanted to live in. We couldn't imagine people throwing themselves on the barricades to be an open proletariat. But we did figure that if people began living the way they wanted to live, that they would defend it. And because a lot of the uh, progressive options were kind of communist inflected, we were all artists and we didn't really feature the idea of doing plays about heroic bus drivers and paintings of elevator operators. So we wanted to imagine a world where we could be authentic, where we could be who we were. And then we wanted to make it real by acting it out. And that's what we did. So we wanted to live in a world with free food. So we went out to the farmer's market, we got food, and we fed 600 people a day for three years. And we got one to live in a world with free medicine, so we got medical students from the University of California to come down once a week and run a clinic. And we wanted to live in a world where we didn't have to get a gig and be an employee so that we could get the money to be a consumer. So we collected the world's garbage and we cleaned it and sorted it and repaired it. And we made a free store where you could get a television or a bicycle or a set of dishes. And because it was a free store, we didn't really have to have a boss. So if you came in and said, who's in charge here? We'd say, you are. Well, the big part of the world we imagined was a multicultural and multiracial world. And even then, in the 60s, the people who gave us the garbage would not give garbage to black folks. They couldn't get food, they couldn't get cast-offs. So the diggers dropped our stuff off and split what we got at the black man's free store. And we had our own uh, newspapers on the street called the Communication Company. But one day in uh, February of 1968, there's a knock on my door, and I was living with the two guys that were printing this paper. We had stolen these big electronic stencil cutting machines from Indiagraphs, and we were printing out these handbills. And the, the opened the door, and there's two young brothers there on the on the stoop, and they introduced themselves. And one Huey knew, looking a little bit younger than he does in that picture there, and the other was Bobby Hutton. So they came in and they were full of ideas about the Black Panther Party, which they had formed and we knew a little bit about. But they wanted a newspaper. So we printed the first three issues of the Black Panther Party newspaper. And then they got it together and it went to Oakland and they printed it out there. But at that time, pre the death of certainly Bobby Hutton, who died a month and a half later, and Martin Luther King, who died two days before Bobby Hutton died, there was a vision of a very different world. A lot of black kids would come up from the Fillmore, and we'd have doo-wop groups, competition, up and down, 
Big Street acapella singing and soccer games, I mean volleyball games over the trolley car wires. And there was a moment in time when all these people were, each was addressing kind of the beast that surrounded all of us in their own way. Some of it were doing simply personal freedom, some of it were doing collective freedom. We were doing cultural freedom because we thought that culture would finally last longer than uh, politics. And I like to add this, in a way that Occupy has not been able to do. I think the Black Panthers actually implemented these programs that is something that needs to happen again, um, by example. It happened and it worked and, and, it, and it was amazing. But the other thing Kathleen says, the difference is the Black Panthers were armed and dangerous. <laughs> All power to the people. All power to the people. Can I hear that again? All power to the people. That was the slogan of the Black Panther Party, one of the many. Um, my name is Billy X. Jennings. I'm a former member of the Black Panther Party, but not really. I'm still a Panther. Um, I, uh, I've been working with the party since I was 17. Uh, what you see here is the very beginning of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was a baby during this period. It only started in 1966. It picked up momentum in 67 when the Panthers went to Sacramento. And it picked up more momentum in October 1967 when Huey Newton was shot and accused of killing the police and wounded another. And that started the free, uh, free Huey movement that went across this country like wildfire. Because what the Black Panther Party was standing on was a 10 point program. 10 principles that you and Bobby laid out of what we want and what we believe. You know, basic stuff like uh, decent housing, decent education. We wanted to end, uh, we wanted all black men to fit for military service. Because you gotta remember in 1965, Johnson signed the voting rights bill. I mean, they were drafting people to go fight in Vietnam for democracy. Where was our democracy? We can't even vote. Now, to bring this home today, uh, black. Our website, www.isaboutimebbp.com, has a lot of information, a lot of videos about the legacy of the Black Panther Party. And I live in Sacramento, California, but I have people traveling across the country from India, from Paris, from England, to our hospital, there's a big archive there, to find out more about the Black Panther Party. The legacy of the party is still alive because people, young people today want to find out how we dealt with problems of yesterday, because the problems of yesterday are still here. They're still here. We have to fight the power of the free.